What is one moment from the Sacramento Kings season that I would change? What do I think Sasha Vizenkov's role will be for the Sacramento Kings going forward? And do I think the Sacramento Kings should pursue Jeremy Grant? It's time for a mailbag edition of the Locked on Kings podcast. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked on Kings. Hello and welcome into Locked on Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all offseason long. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use code all lowercase locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports anchor and reporter for ABC 10 News. And it's been a long time since I've been able to do a mail bag episode. I went on social media. I went on the most recent Locked on Kings podcast and I asked for you to submit your Kings related questions and I would uh, compile the, the, the best ones that I saw into a podcast episode for me to answer. So I have eight questions here gathered from over email, gathered from Twitter or X, uh, and also gathered from YouTube. Eight questions that I'm going to answer here, and I want to hear your answers to as well. Whether you submitted the question or you're just here along for the ride to hear my responses, your responses are key as well. So whatever of these questions or all of these questions, if you want to answer them, feel free to do so. If you're watching on YouTube in the YouTube comment section down below, if you are a Twitter user or an X user, you can answer the questions directly to me on X at MattGeorgeSack, or you can email me MattGeorgeSports at gmail.com. But let's get into these eight questions, and we'll start first with a question from Luke over email. He says, you can go back and change one moment from this Kings season. What do you change? I actually thought about this this long and hard because there are a handful of moments that I would certainly correct that could play a big difference. One of the first moments that came to mind was the Kings losing by one point at home to the Phoenix Suns in the final stretch of the season, right? Had the Kings won that game, they more than likely would have, well, they, they would have, assuming they beat the Portland Trailblazers as badly as they did on the final day of the regular season, they would have secured the eight seed. Even if they lost to the Pelicans... In, uh, in, in that first round of the Pelicans ended up with the seventh seed. I like Sacramento's chances at home against either the Warriors, who they ended up beating, of course, or the LA Lakers, who the Kings beat four times. So I have a pretty good feeling that had the Kings won that game, they would have made the playoffs outright. That being said, that's not the game that I chose. That's not the change that I chose. The change that I chose was Malik Monk getting injured against the Dallas Mavericks, game two against the Dallas Mavericks. Now, this moment in particular for a handful of reasons. Number one, just for that game itself, the Kings and the Mavericks, we know how important that game was. Kings had lost game one rather convincingly, or or the, the Mavericks certainly looked like the better team in game one. Sacramento was off to a decent start in game two before Malik Monk ended up getting hurt with uh, Luka Doncic kind of falling on him awkwardly. That game alone, the Kings win that game. I'm not saying that's going to stop the meteoric rise that the Dallas Mavericks had to where now they're in the second round of the playoffs. But maybe that win gives the Kings a little more momentum, gets them back on track, and maybe their race with Dallas in the Western Conference playoff race at that time is a lot closer than it ended up being. That being said, too, Malik Monk doesn't get hurt. The Kings make the playoffs outright, in my opinion. Like I, I just don't see them losing some of the games that they lost down the stretch of the season with Malik Monk as part of their roster, right? So Malik Monk having played for the Kings, whether it was in the play-in tournament or throughout the remainder of the regular season, I think the Kings would have made the playoffs outright. I think the Kings would still be playing right now, regardless of the circumstances, has uh, had uh, Malik Monk not gotten hurt. So that's the moment that easily I would change. As soon as Malik Monk's injury happened, that's where the season kind of spiraled downhill uh, for the Kings. Now, there were uh, plenty of mistakes that the Kings made over the course of this season when Malik Monk was healthy. So that doesn't excuse those, right? But 
down the stretch of the season, the Kings had kind of their worst stretch of the year, a lot of it having to do with missing Malik Monk and Kevin Herter, of course. And we know how that ended up knocking the Kings from a a guaranteed playoff spot as a top six seed to ending up in the ninth seed and having to win two games just to get in. And of course, they were not able to do that. So that's the what I would change, the Malik Monk injury versus the Mavs. Next question from Eric over email. He says, what's your best memory from the Kings season. I was tempted to say the win against the Golden State Warriors in the first play-in game just to kind of end the dynasty and get kind of that revenge and how that atmosphere was basically a playoff atmosphere. And it was just really a night of celebration. But I'm going to go with Keegan Murray's 47-point night against the Utah Jazz when he hit 12 three-pointers. Right, That was a night that, like, that's where we saw, oh my goodness, Keegan Murray is capable of completely taking over a basketball game, and he's capable of doing it over the course of a game. Now, I think it was the third quarter in particular where he got like white hot and he hit a boatload of shots and really started to pour it on. But Keegan was good basically that entire night. Like start to finish, it was Keegan Murray's game, and the Sacramento Kings did a really, really good job of continuing to feed and go to Keegan and feed that hot hand, which is something that they've struggled to do at times in the first two seasons of Keegan's career, especially when he got off to a hot start, right? Keegan passing both Malik Monk and De'Aaron Fox in in a career high 47 points, I thought was fun too, kind of added to the moment with the relationship that those three have. But that was in some ways like another arrival moment for Keegan Murray of, oh yeah, this guy is capable of being a star scorer at times for Sacramento, which remember coming into the season, that's what we were expecting a lot of. We were hoping for, hey, this is going to be the jump for Keegan offensively where he becomes more of a create-your-own-shot type player, comes more of an isolation score, more of a go-to score for Sacramento. Ultimately, offensively, he did in some ways take a step back because his three-point shooting wasn't as good this season as it was his rookie season. He didn't advance as much as we would have liked to have seen as a individual go-to score, but defensively, he improved astronomically, right? So it was still a very, very solid season for Keegan Murray, and this moment, this game, 47 points against the Jazz, was a really, really fun night. But to me, what's even more encouraging is that we know Keegan is still going to get better, right? There's still a tremendous amount of room to grow. And that night, this game in particular, was a glimpse into this is how good, how dangerous, and how capable Keegan is of taking over a basketball game. I don't know if we're ever going to see him go for 47 points again or hit 12 three-pointers in a game again, but him being able to do that in his second season, yeah, it gives you hope that, hey, 30-point nights, more than every once in a while. Hey, maybe that could happen for Keegan and for the Sacramento Kings going forward. Final question here of this first segment, and then we'll get into a lot of questions about off-season acquisitions. Those are a lot of questions that I got from you guys about chasing certain players or re-signing certain players. Of course, the off-season and free agency is on everybody's mind, even trades. Uh, We'll get to a lot of those questions in the next segment. But this final question is from... I don't know how to pronounce your name on Twitter or on X. It's H-J-N-N-K-N-V-U-X. No idea. But their question was, what role will Sasha Vazenkov play next season? I think this is going to be more of a topic of conversation later on in the offseason once we have an idea of what this roster is going to look like. Because I think we believe that it's not going to be another run-it-back year. But we also don't believe or don't expect it to be a complete roster overhaul year. right? Like I, I still expect a large portion of this roster to, to be back. Now, I expect some key changes, some key additions and things like that. So don't... don't misinterpret what I'm saying is the Kings should just run everything back again because I, I don't agree with that at all. But I don't even know if Sasha Vazenkov is going to be a part of this team next season. Now, of course, he's under contract. I don't know how much value he has in the trade market. So I don't expect the Kings to attach Sasha to any kind of deal, although maybe a team wants a European sharpshooter, and he can help sweeten the deal on a trade. I have no idea. If Sasha Vizenkov is a part of the Sacramento Kings going forward, I expect 
his role to kind of be the same. Your job is to come off the bench, be a volume scorer, stretch the floor, knock down threes, defensively have a presence. And if Mike Brown is determined to stick with this defensive first path, which there's no reason to believe he'll 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 go off of it, and if he's expecting the Kings to play the defense that they were playing at the end of the season from day one of next season over the course of a full 82-game season and into the playoffs, I question how Sasha is going to be able to consistently break his way into that rotation. Right? I just, I don't see it. Sasha's role is very straightforward to me. You know what he is. You know what he brings. And there are going to be times where absolutely you need that offensive spark from Sasha. Defensively, that's always going to be the difference between him playing enough minutes to make an impact or sitting on the bench and watching. Now, Sasha made it very clear in his end-of-season press conference that there were times where he was frustrated that he wanted to play. He also says he doesn't regret his decision at all leaving the Euro League, where he was a freaking MVP to come to Sacramento and have DNPs and ride the bench for a lot of the year. I do think Sasha absolutely can be valuable to the Sacramento Kings team going forward, but I think Sasha is the case of let's see what he looks like in training camp. Let's see how different he looks. Remember, he's an older player. He's not a young guy, so I don't expect drastic changes to his game, but maybe after a year in the league, he's kind of caught up with the speed. Defensively, he's worked on his game during the offseason. He's a little more ready on that end of the floor, while offensively, he can just give Sacramento that three-point shooting and volume scoring that that second unit could need. But as of right now, I think the expectation should be that Sasha is going to be fighting hard just to crack the rotation, and the role will be relatively the same. Like I said at the top of the show, today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It's the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more players' stats and watch the winnings roll in. Prize Picks is one of the best ways to add some extra enjoyment to NBA playoff basketball, right? You can select a handful of players in different statistical categories, right? Let's say for game two of the Timberwolves and the Denver Nuggets, let's say you could take more or less on like 50 combined points, rebounds, and assists for Nikola Jokic. Maybe you're expecting a massive triple-double from Jokic in game two to get the Nuggets back on track. So you take more on that, plus you take more on 20... Nine and a half points on Anthony Edwards with how well he's been scoring. You do that, add a couple more statistics, maybe like more on two and a half made threes for Michael Porter Jr. or two and a half dunks for Aaron Gordon, right? There's three right there. You put $20 down on that, you could win a a good chunk of change if all three of those hit. That's just an example of how you can play with just one game prize picks. Of course, you can stagger a bunch of different games going on at the same time in the NBA playoffs. You could partner NBA picks with baseball picks happening at the same time. There's so many fun and unique ways to play. Prize picks is really simple to play as well. It's not hard to catch on. You can make your entries in 60 seconds or less. And when you win, withdraws to your bank account to get that money that you win. It's quick. It's easy. You'll have it. You'll have your money really before you know it faster than any other site, fantasy sports site, betting site, anything like that that I've ever experienced before. So go and download the app today and use code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, that's promo code uh, locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Locked on Kings is also brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything that you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you are looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed your fit your ride the first time, every time, or you get your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not burning cash. With all the parts you need at the prices that you want, it's easy to take your car and make it the MVP and bring home those wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions do apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. 
All right, time for some free agency slash off-season edition questions, trade questions. I got a whole lot of these, and it was hard for me to narrow them down. A lot of them were actually very similar questions about very similar players. So I might pick a question from somebody who basically asked the same question as you and say their name and not yours. I, I, I hope. You don't take offense to that. I just grabbed the the, the first one that I saw kind of in that category, the one that phrased the question in a way that I thought was interesting and easy to uh, respond to. So let's start with uh, a question from YouTube. Fireman1521 asks, do you see the Kings re-signing Alex Len this offseason? Boy, I hope so, right? Again, not wanting the Kings just to run everything back from last year because, yes, they have to make changes. Here I am saying, hey, the Kings need to bring back Malik Monk. Hey, the Kings need to bring back Alex Len. But it's true, right? We know how important Malik Monk is. I don't need to make a case for that. Alex Len for me, though, I mean, he's everything that you want out of the role that he's supposed to be playing. Now, I do understand people who would want the Kings to go out and find a backup center that's either one more of a rim protector than Alex Len is, or two can kind of replicate what Demonis Sabonis does. That player doesn't really exist, right? I, I have seen some people talking about, hey, maybe the Kings try and knock on the door of the, the New Orleans Pelicans who are trying to make some changes and find a way to get Jonas Valanciunas here in Sacramento. I have no idea how that would work. I have no idea if Valanciunas would accept an off-the-bench role. That would be pretty awesome, except for the fact that Demondis Sabonis is still going to play a boatload of minutes. And unless Valanciunas is taking a minutes cut or you're struggling to, or trying to find a way to get both of them on the court at the same time, which I guess could happen if you want Sabonis to space the floor a little more and shoot some more threes. I don't know how that looks. I do know how Alex Len looks, right? Alex Len comes in. He plays his role to basically perfection. He sets some of the best screens in the NBA period. He's a big body. He has size that even if he doesn't block shots, he changes shots in the paint. He's an interior presence. He rebounds the ball well. He's a smart basketball player, and he's familiar with what the Sacramento Kings are doing, and he's not going to cost a whole heck of a lot. Why wouldn't I want the Sacramento Kings to bring Alex Len back and and, and keep him here in Sacramento? So to answer your question, Fireman1521, I absolutely, absolutely would love for the Kings to re-sign Alex Len. Now, if they lose him, of course, it's not the end of the world. You, in theory, can find another backup big out there that does very similar things to what Alex Len does. I think Alex Len absolutely has a market. He's an NBA backup center for sure, a rotation center, and there's a lot of teams in this league that would like to use what Alex brings to the table. He's not going to command a whole lot in the open uh, market as well, so you don't have to worry about financially doing too much to try and keep him, right? And if it doesn't make sense, then you let him walk. But I would not mind at all seeing Alex Len still in a Kings uniform uh, come the start of next season. Now from Bands916 on X, should the Kings circle back at Jeremy Grant with a package around Barnes and the 13th overall pick? So this trade would have to happen on draft night. So the Kings call up the Portland Trailblazers on draft night and say, we will make a selection for you at 13 plus give you Harrison Barnes and we get Jeremy Grant. My first initial reaction to this before even looking up the money situation is it's going to take more than that, both money-wise and value-wise. I know the Portland Trailblazers aren't a good team. The Portland Trailblazers have committed a lot of money to Jeremy Grant. Just last season, they signed him to a a five-year contract. He's owed $29.7 million next season. $29.7 $29.7 million, which is significantly more than Harrison Barnes. And after that, he's still got three years left on his deal with the third year being a pretty hefty player option. That amount of money goes up every single year until he's in the 30s, million dollar wise. He's going to accept that player option in my mind. So you're making a pretty big financial investment into Jeremy Grant. I don't know what kind of effect that has on your Malik Monk sweepstakes or not or in that situation. Do I think Jeremy Grant would help the Sacramento Kings? 100%. I mean, he averaged 21 points, three rebounds, two assists, shot 40% from three-point range for the Portland Trail Blazers last season. So, yes, he would be an upgrade over Harrison Barnes for sure, 100%. couple issues that I have. One, like I said, I think it's going to take more than just 13 in Harrison Barnes. I think it financially has to. The Kings had, would have to add more to that deal to make the money work, in my opinion, at least I, I, I think so. I haven't run it through the trade machine or anything like that. Plus, if I'm Portland... 
I want another draft pick or I want a young player, maybe a Davion Mitchell or something on top of that. I don't know if that's a deal breaker for the Sacramento Kings or not. The other problem that I have with this is I don't look at what Jeremy Grant did in Portland and say, you just take that and put it in Sacramento. He's more of a threat every single day, especially offensively, than Harrison Barnes is for sure. Defensively, it's kind of a push. Um, maybe the, I think there's certain ways that Harrison's better defensively. There's certain ways that Jeremy Grant's better defensively. Jeremy's not one that, unless I'm missing a part of Jeremy Grant's game, I don't remember really ever considering Jeremy Grant a great defender or looking at his defense over his offense or anything like that. He's an offensive addition to your team, which the Kings could absolutely use 100%. But again, you have to remember the role that these guys will be playing versus the role that he's playing in Portland right now. He is a volume scorer in Portland on a bad team that just gets shots up. Like he and Shaden Sharp, like they, they, like they Scoot Henderson, like their job is just to score the basketball. That is what he's paid to do in Portland. And nothing really is standing in his way. In Sacramento, he's behind Fox. He's behind Sabonis. If they bring Malik Monk back, he's probably behind Malik Monk, assuming Malik is a starter. He might be battling with Keegan, and hopefully for the Kings, eventually Keegan would be surpassing him if he continues to develop offensively in the way that the Kings that are hoping Keegan will surpass him. So do I think Jeremy Grant would disappear as often as Harrison Barnes disappeared for the Kings last season? No, and maybe that alone is enough for you to go, that's why I want him. But paying almost $30 million a year, and eventually you will be in the $30 million a year range to bring in a guy who you're looking at as your third or fourth option offensively. I just don't think these numbers are going to hold up. You definitely get more of a threat. It's definitely an upgrade. You're paying a lot to have someone who's not going to have the same volume or same scoring responsibilities in Sacramento, in my opinion, that they have in Portland. But hey, maybe that's what the Kings need more of. So... To answer the question, I think the Kings should absolutely be on the phone. They should absolutely consider it. But he's not one of those guys that I would go all in for by whatever means. Another question from Twitter. Kyle Glasson asks, what do you think of Jonathan Isaac from the Orlando Magic? Is he worth flipping Herder or Barnes for? Talked about Jonathan Isaac on the Locked on Kings podcast a handful of months ago. It was probably after the game where he torched the Kings in in Orlando. I've liked Jonathan Isaac for a very long time. Jonathan Isaac, in so many ways, is the exact type of player that the Kings need more of, right? A defensive-minded, lengthy, athletic wing who sometimes can give you some stuff on the offensive end. What the Kings saw out of Isaac this year is not what he is normally. Like, if you watch the playoffs and watch the Cavs, who just eliminated the magic you'll see Jonathan Isaac is capable of having offensive moments but he's definitely more of a defensive first wing but he's a defensive first wing that can shut guys down and win you a basketball game unfortunately with Jonathan Isaac he's also been very injury prone over his career however he did a good job this season to kind of put that behind him he paid he played 58 games during the regular season he played of course during the playoffs as well but 58 regular season games is really good for Jonathan Isaac considering he only played 11 games in the three seasons before that combined. So he's he's dealt with some pretty significant injury issues that have held him out for a lar- large portion of his career. Does he still have something in the tank to offer? 100%. Jonathan Isaac has also paid uh, $17.4 million next season, and then he's a free agent. So if the Kings make an, a, a trade for Isaac, they run the risk of losing him for nothing and not being able to re-sign him. I don't think that's as massive or concerning as a risk as it would be going after a Brandon Ingram type player that has one year left on their deal, right? But I have I have a couple questions. One, what does it take? I, I'm not even going to begin to speculate on what I think it would take to get the Magic to, to move on from Jonathan Isaac because they do value him there. They are thinking about paydays going forward. They're thinking about paydays for Jalen Suggs. They're going to eventually have to pay Franz Wagner and Paolo Bancaro, right? So they got to start thinking about the future of their books and how much do they want that to be taken up by Jonathan Isaac, number one. Number two, let's say the Kings make this deal. Let's say the Kings, because the, the Magic have cap space. They have room. So the Kings don't necessarily have to send back $17. million or more in salary to get him. 
So let's say the Kings find a way to trade a future first round. That would be too much. Uh, I was going to say a future first round pick and like a Davion Mitchell, but that might be too much. Some kind of Davion, <laughs> excuse me, some kind of Davion Mitchell, Sasha Vizenkov package. I don't, I have no idea if the Magic would say yes to that. Part of, probably not. But a package that's less money going to Orlando to get Jonathan Isaac here. Does that help the Orlando Magic pay the money that they maybe were hesitant to pay to get Malik Monk out of Sacramento and go to Orlando? You know, we've talked about the Magic a whole hell of a lot recently about how they are the biggest threat, in my opinion, to pay Malik Monk and steal him away from Sacramento in free agency. If the Kings were to trade for Jonathan Isaac, take some of that money off the books to where they feel a little more comfortable putting that $22 plus million on the table to bring Malik to Orlando, I don't know if I want to help them <laughs> in, in, in that scenario if I'm Sacramento. So there's a lot about Jonathan Isaac that I like. I'm kind of f- going through a lot of hypothetical scenarios without anything really concrete to give you in these these conversations because there's there's nothing really there. Bottom line is, I'm definitely interested in Jonathan Isaac. I would not hate the Kings pursuing Jonathan Isaac. He's a player that the Kings absolutely could use. I just don't know how they get him without giving up too much or putting Orlando in a position to take away something in Malik Monk that they highly value. All right, game off. I'm going to pause here to talk more about Monopoly Go, one of the great sponsors here of the Locked On Kings podcast. I know what you're saying. Hey, flag on the play, Matt. Unnecessarily timeout. You're out of timeouts. You're spending too much time on ad reads. We've already talked about this stuff. I know I understand, but I really got to tell you more about this game because it's not only a great sponsor of the podcast. This is a game that I'm addicted to, like straight up addicted to at this point. In Monopoly Go, you can team up with friends for timed tournaments where you work together to build up each other's boards. You, uh, The more that you win together, the more awesome prizes that you unlock. And there's so many different things that you can get, like unique stickers that you can trade with friends to complete albums for all sorts of big prizes. You get cool new playing pieces to travel the board with, hilarious emojis for taunting friends when you smash their buildings or heist their vaults. Plus, Monopoly Go feels new and and exciting every day with constantly changing tournaments and challenges. A ton include their own unique mini games like Digging for Treasure or a robot pachinko machine. And there's always new timed events that help you win big, like massive multipliers for everything that you win or rent frenzies. There's always something fun to discover in Monopoly Go, so get off the bench and get into the action. Download it now for free on Google Play or the App Store and game on. All right, I got two more questions here to wrap up our mailbag. And again, if you want to answer some of these questions yourself, weigh in on on, uh, if you like or don't like my answers or if you agree or disagree, go for it. Comment section down below on YouTube. Hit me up on Twitter at MattGeorgeSack. Email me MattGeorgeSports at gmail.com. This next question comes from Tim Frost on Twitter. Do you see a realistic possibility of the Kings finding a light of fire personality in free agency or via trade? I know leadership and those vocal light light of fire leaders, that's been something that we've talked about a lot here in Sacramento over the hand, last few seasons. It's really been a consistent topic of conversation over De'Aaron Fox's tenure here in Sacramento because Fox is not looked at as that kind of guy. Now, on the court, he's a trash talker. He's definitely not super quiet, necessarily. He's not someone that is very introverted and is not going to speak his mind. But he's not necessarily the physical, uh, like visible, on the floor, kind of get in your face, yell, fire you up type leader that some in Sacramento feel that the Kings need more of. I'll say this. JaVale McGee is kind of one of those guys. JaVale McGee is one of those guys that the Kings brought in to be a vocal leader, and he was that for the Kings from day one. Would we say that JaVale McGee worked out here in Sacramento this season or really made that big of a difference for the Kings? Maybe in ways that we don't see, but ultimately, not really, right? And I'm not using that to bash JaVale McGee because he's a good veteran and and, and a a good leader, but it didn't make that big of a difference or as big of a difference as I think some people are hoping for. When I look to leadership for the Sacramento Kings, I do know that Trey Lyles, who is in my opinion, for sure going to be a part of the Kings going forward. I don't see the Kings moving on from him this offseason. 
he is one of those vocal leaders. He's kind of stepped up into that role. He's one of the guys that that led the players only meeting that the Kings had earlier on in the season. So he's kind of stepped up into that role. And even if it's not Fox and Sabonis's personalities to be loud, kind of yell leaders, they still are leaders. They still have their leadership styles, and the Kings are still looking to them for leadership. So growth and leadership and accountability has to begin with them. I don't know who the Kings could go out and realistically get in free agency other than an absolute superstar who comes in and says, this is my team now, which is not going to happen. I don't know who the Kings could go out and get who's going to come in and is going to say, I acknowledge Sabonis and Fox is the guys here in Sacramento, but I'm the leader now. I'm the captain. You follow me. And I'm not saying that Fox and Sabonis are the type of personalities that are like, you you can't be a leader. You can't have a voice. It's me. That's never been the case at all. But I just I I don't think it's a priority for the Sacramento. It's 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 lower on the list of priorities for the Kings to look for a light of fire leadership personality in free agency or in a trade this offseason compared to maybe in years past. They have guys that are leaders. They have Mike Brown and this coaching staff to some extent. Fox and Sabonis are leaders in their own way. Do the Kings need better leadership and better accountability at times? Sure. But I think they're looking more to the roster and the guys who we know or we have a very good idea are still going to be here to bring that leadership and not another one year veteran playoff or uh, or veteran free agent signing like JaVale McGee was to come in here and suddenly bring a revelation of leadership to this locker room and to this organization. I just don't think that really, really exists, but I guess there could be some players out there that, that could address that if you have concerns about that. Final question is from Aiden over email. Who is your dream addition to the Sacramento Kings to make them a title contender? Now, interpretation of this question, I think, is really important because the word dream suggests that it could be anybody and it doesn't matter how realistic it is or not. And if that's the case, then like Giannis Antetokounmpo comes to mind or, or, or something like that, right? But I choose to answer this question with as much of a realistic wishful thinking as I can, if that makes sense. Like the name, and this is a name that if you've listened to Locked on Kings for a while, you know I've coveted this guy and wanted this guy here in Sacramento forever. He is one of the guys that I would, without hesitation, trade Keegan Murray for. And you know that's a that's a, a big different a big deal for me. The, I, I don't know if there's anybody on this roster that I wouldn't trade to get this guy. And I'm not saying it's likely I'm not saying it's even possible, but it's not as absurd as getting the top MVP superstar candidates in the league, right? Jalen Brown. Jalen Brown, to me, is exactly what this Kings team wants and needs, right? You bring Jalen Brown, you take Jalen Brown from Boston right now and you add him to this Kings core of Fox, Murray, and Sabonis, Kings are a title contender in my opinion. Is Jalen the guy here in Sacramento? think he's 1B. He's used to being the Robin to Jason Tatum's Batman, and maybe, to be fair, maybe Jalen Brown doesn't want to be a Robin anymore, but I think if Jalen Brown came to Sacramento, the Kings are instantly a really, really, really extremely dangerous team. I'm saying it's not a complete fantasy and a complete fairy tale because Jason Tatum is in Boston. We've heard rumors of disconnects there and things like that. If the Boston Celtics don't win it all this season... Maybe they have the now Kristaps Porzingis injury excuse, but I don't know where Boston goes from here if they don't win it this year. So I don't expect this to happen. I know it's a very, 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 very small chance, but you talk about a dream addition to the Sacramento Kings. It's Jalen Brown. It's been Jalen Brown for years. I would love to have Jalen Brown in a Sacramento Kings uniform. I think the Kings would be unbelievable if they could make that happen. Probably not going to happen, but that would be my dream addition. All right, I want to hear your thoughts and your responses to all of these questions. Also want to let you know that I know the schedule was kind of weird this week with releasing podcasts and stuff like that. I apologize. I'm getting back to a consistent schedule next week. At least that's the plan. Because next week I'm launching our season grades series, right? Every single day I'll have grades for at least three players starting tomorrow with De'Aaron Fox, Demonda Sabonis, and Malik Monk. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, all five days. I plan on, again, life could happen or I'm still battling this sickness or something could happen. Hopefully everything's fine. 
But I plan on every single day next week releasing a different set of grades for each uh, for the, the Kings roster. I'll also include grades for Monty McNair and the Kings front office. I'll also include uh, grades for Mike Brown and the Kings coaching staff. So those will be mixed in there as well. We'll get through this week of all those grades. Once we're done with that, then we can kind of put a bow on this season and we'll turn our attention to the draft lottery, which is coming up, and we'll start to drive it, dive into some draft coverage, get some draft experts on here, look at this draft class, look at potential players that the Kings could target at 13, talk about the possibility of the value of the 13th pick in the trade market, right? We'll start to get into the draft after next week and after these grades. So make sure you tune in for that. I hope to see you then. Until then, thank you to all you who submitted questions. I appreciate it. I will do another mailbag like this later on in the off season. So thank you for uh, those questions and thank you for your support as always. Can't wait to have you join me on the next episode of Locked on Kings. Until then, my name is Matt George. You've been listening to the Locked on Kings podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network.